Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon and welcome. Thanks to the generosity of our distinguished alum, uh, Greg Hartman, uh, we are now able to celebrate our Charles Savinfield signature lecture every semester, both in fall and spring. This spring, it is our pleasure to welcome biologist Tarain Mee. Uh, Tarin is a member of the Biomimicry 3.8 network, a network of several organizations that seek to bring us closer to the wisdom of nature. Her training in ecology and the socio-industrial aspects of environmental issues provides a system-based platform for discussing the principles and methodologies of biomimicking. As a biologist at the design table for the biomimicry group, uh, she specializes in nature's functions at the ecosystem level. Tareen grew up in the woods of the rural Midwest, but her adventures, educational endeavors, and employment have since moved her around the country and around the world to places uh, like Florida, Brazil, Colorado, Alaska, California, and many other places that uh, I, I've learned this morning through my interaction with her. So uh, please uh, welcome, uh, help me welcome Tareen Meads. Thank you. Thank you so much. So it's good to be back in the Midwest. Um, I don't get to come home as nearly as much as I would like to, as happens when you move away, but just the rolling hills, or the, not the hills, it's the, uh, the topography of the trees is what's really interesting for me here. So I'm really glad to be back. Um, and as Guillermo mentioned, I am a biologist, and I think that I am the only biologist who has ever been through this lecture series. So thank you all for coming and turning out for this rarity. Um, I'm currently based out of um, Yosemite, California. The, the organization I work for is based out of Montana. But um, I do a lot of traveling for lectures like this and um, to do client work in a lot of different places. So thank you so much for having me here, for the, here today. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to the most incredible thing on Earth, life. So this butterfly, this morpho butterfly, looks this brilliant blue color, right? But actually there's no blue pigment in this butterfly. The only pigment that's actually here is brown. And the color is created by the overlaying of scales uh, in such a way that when the light refracts on it, um, what's viewed by the, um, the onlooker is this blue color. And so if, if we think about how humans would try to make a similar material, we would mine hard minerals, right? And then we'd heat, beat, and treat, and we'd return them, to this, we'd turn them into this, in this blue color. But as you can see, this organism has learned how to do it out of pollen and uh, sugars that it extracts from plants. So we're not the first ones that have tried to figure out how to create colored surfaces. And this spider can produce a silk that is pound per square inch stronger than steel. Again, with just bug parts, right? Chemistry based in water. And so we're not the first organisms that have tried to make strong, lightweight materials. This is a sea urchin. It makes a calcium carbonate base similar to what we use in concrete production, but it does it by laying out a protein template and then attracting the molecules of calcium and carbon together to form this hard material. We're not the first organisms to have a need for this concrete. This is a mangrove forest. And mangroves, because of their habitats constantly changing on coastal areas, um, the, they're always putting out root systems to stabilize the soil and creating their own habitats. They're always creating structural support for themselves and stabilizing ground, just like we have to do. This coconut is made of long chain carbons. 
What else do we use on a day-to-day -day basis that's made of long chain carbons? Plastic, right? But this coconut is taking uh, CO2 from the air. Does anybody have any extra CO2 that we could use anywhere? And it's using a catalyst to put them in a form that creates this lightweight but strong material that lasts up to two to three years. So you think of every plastic cup that we have, um, we only need it for two to three years typically, and then it should be cycled back into the environment again. So these organisms have learned how to produce a material that's very similar to our needs. And this is the maple leaf. And this, this is an excellent example of a distribution system in the natural world. So we hire lots of engineers to figure out the best transportation distribution pattern or um, the dis best distribution system for water. But perhaps there's something we can learn from the maple leaf about creating an optimized system. Um, maybe we just did the math on figuring out what this distribution system was like. It might save ourselves a lot of trouble. So we have 3.85 billion years of experience on this planet. And if you multiply that times 30 to 100 million species, we have a whole lot of well-adapted design. We're not the first people to have, we're the first organisms to try to figure out how to solve these problems. So we oftentimes say that biomimicry is using nature as model, measure, and mentor. We also say that it is a new way of viewing and valuing the natural world based not on what we can extract from it, not what we can take from it, but on what we can learn from it. So when we say nature is model, what we're saying is what would nature do? Okay, this is the functional component of it. So all the organisms on the planet are performing functions for survival, just like we have to. So how can we abstract the design principles from what they're doing and apply those design principles to the functions that we're trying to perform? We also can use biomimicry with nature as measure. So um, what are the performance metrics of the natural world? What are the performance criteria that we should be gleaning for our materials, for our water resistance, for our uh, carbon sequestration, um, based on the way that a natural system would do it? And then finally, nature as mentor asks the question, how would nature do it? So before we even start a design process, we go out and assess a natural system to determine how the natural system would do it. So I'll get into some more examples in just a few minutes, but I just want to lay some mental frameworks. Um, biomimicry is the conscious emulation of nature's genius. And these words were chosen really carefully because when we say conscious, what we're saying is that we're actively going out and seeking solutions, okay? When we say emulation, we're not saying that we want to copy what the natural world's doing. We're not talking about bioengineering. We're not talking about um, putting fish hormones or fish genes into strawberries to make them more, give them better water retention, which does happen. Um, we're talking about understanding how a system functions, abstracting the design principle, and then applying that design principle to our design. And when we say nature's genius, well, that's that 3.85 billion years of experience that I was talking about before. Environmental problems, right? What's some environmental problems? You got an example? Smog. Smog. Thank you. What else? Greenhouse gases. Greenhouse gases. Flooding. Overgrazing. Overgrazing. Sprawl. Good, good, we got lots of problems, it's true. <laughs> we have a ton of them, we didn't even scratch the surface, right? But biomimicry says that there's no value judgment on these problems. It's not right or wrong, it's not good or bad. It's just whether or not we can fit in, whether or not we can be, participate in the system that we're a part of in a really meaningful way. And so here we have a few examples of maladapted design, if you will. There's no such, no such thing as waste in the natural world. This first image shows, shows waste in a landfill, right? But in the natural world, everything is constantly being upcycled and recycled. And anything that's excess is actually viewed in a in more valuable light. So natural systems take, avail take advantage of what's available um, 
rather than it's very difficult to get things that are scarce. So those things aren't as valuable. For us, gold is really valuable because it's scarce, right? So it's, we have kind of the opposite paradigm the natural world has. Um, we also do chemistry that can't even touch our body because it's so dangerous. We have to protect ourselves from the chemistries that we do to make household cleaners and um, things that we expose our bodies to all the time. In the natural world, chemistry is done in water, in or near the organism's body that's producing it. And toxics are used, but they're used in very small quantities and they're used on demand when, at the moment that the organism needs them. And then the, the last image here is an example of um, one way that we produce things, which is through heat, beat, and treat manufacturing. Okay, so if you can imagine we have a ball of raw material, that's 100% of something that's going to be this at the end. Okay, so to get the material that we need for this out of that ball of raw material, we're going to heat it up to high temperatures, we're going to treat it with harsh chemicals, and we're going to beat it with high pressures. And then we're going to throw away 97% of that ball of material, and we're going to end up with this. This is unheard of in the natural world. Energy is too expensive to waste that much of it. But I'm going to offer that we are nature, and that everything that we do is natural, and that we have the capacity to participate in a natural system in a way that um, we can go forward with sustainably. Because we have this innovation tool for fitting in. So we have the designers running around saying, how should we design? Oh my gosh, what's the best way? What do people need? What does it mean to be sustainable here? What does it mean to live on this planet appropriately? And then you have biologists running around asking, well, what should we study? What are important questions? What does the world need to know? Our amount of informa the amount of information that we can understand about the biological world is doubling every five years. Like This is an enormous curve of understanding that we didn't have 30 years ago. And it's an immense opportunity then to, cross, to work across disciplines to incorporate this amount of research. And that's what we focus on in biomimicry. How can we communicate between disciplines to be a well-adapted species? This is the fundamental question that we're trying to get at. So what does it mean to live here? As I mentioned, all the organisms on the planet are subjected to the same uh, basic environmental conditions. So just a little bit of defining of those, okay? So the first characteristic is that the Earth is water-based. Uh, this is defining characteristics of the Earth. Um, life depends on it. Life emerged from water. It's a major cycler of nutrients. Um, and it's fundamental to our existence. Another operating condition is that the Earth is subject to limits and boundaries. So if you notice this first sphere over here, this pink one, that represents all of the atmosphere on the planet, that surrounds the planet, rather. So even though you know, the, we think about CO2, the amount of CO2 changing, as it being this really sort of amorphous thing that we, we can't really put our finger on, if you look at it proportionately to the size of the Earth, it's not really very much. Along those same lines, and this blue sphere represents all of the water on the planet. It's all of the water in fresh water, salt water, ice caps, aquifers, every last drop. And that's given that this is so vital to life. I mean, this is a very important resource we have to, important limit and boundary we have to consider. And this is my favorite operating condition, because I think it, re it, re it tells the most about the human species. This operating condition says that the Earth is in a state of dynamic non-equilibrium. All that means really is the Earth is constantly changing. So organisms, if you can imagine that the bowl here is all the abiotic factors on the planet. So that's all the non-living factors, things like climate, hydrology, earthquakes, um, anything that doesn't include like a biological response. Those conditions are always shifting and changing. Okay, and as, as the bowl shifts, um, the way that life has learned to fit in is by being round. Okay, so then the bowl shifts, the ball rolls down to the point where it requires the least amount of energy to hold position. Okay, so it's the point where Mother Nature's kind of lazy. You know, it just kind of goes where it's like, it's easy to stay right here, so I'll adapt to be right here. 
So if you compare that then to how humans design, <laughs> we uh, build square things, and plop them down in the bowl, and then we put a lot of energy into holding the bowl still. Right? Rather than changing our behaviors to um, putting a sweater on if it's cold inside, we turn the heat up. Right? So it's just little subtle things like this that, I mean, technology has graced our lives with this kind of control over our environments. At the same time, we're kind of shooting ourselves in the foot with it. So in response to um, these abiotic factors or all these uh, operating conditions, life has evolved a set of uh, patterns that we can use as design guidelines. So we talk about life's principles a lot. And this is a concept map that we've developed at Biomimicry 3.8. We've been working with it now. The first iteration came out in Janine Benyus' book in um, 1997. She's one of the co-founders, if those of you are familiar um, with the organization, or with Janine's book. And then since then, we've been collecting different operating conditions or different life's principles from um, lots of different sources. And the list actually now includes about um, 27, I believe. But for the purposes of teaching and consulting, we oftentimes just refer to these top six because it's a little more manageable. Um, but if you're, any of you're interested in going more in depth with it, I'm happy to provide more resources later. But the life's principles include things like life is always evolving to survive. Life is always resource efficient. It's always adapting to changing conditions. Um, it's locally attuned and responsive. It's integrating growth with development. So oftentimes, this is kind of interesting, I think, in an urban planning sense, because we keep growing and growing and growing, and we aren't necessarily developing. So that, that I think it's incongruous in, in, in a planning setting. Or the maturation of communities isn't happening um, in a way that is, accommodates the growth, or vice versa. And then life also uses life-friendly chemistries, as I was talking about, the benign manufacturing piece. So how will we bridge the gap between these two paradigms we have of natural systems and human systems? Within the world of biomimicry, we find that, um, I, so I, like I said, I do a lot of teaching and lecturing. And I find that people come to biomimicry for one of three reasons. Um, one, they're really connected to the natural world, and they wa or they want to deepen that connection. So that's the reconnect piece. Or they have a, um, a sustainability ethic. This is the ethos piece that I have up here. So they come to us because they want to know, they want more tools for their toolbox. You know, they know LEED and they know ISO standards and they want another tool. Or for the emulate piece, which is the, like I was saying, the, the mimicking of natural systems. And so this is a, just a really, I just wanted to give a really quick intro to, during the emulation, component of the work that we do and when we train people in the emulation process, we've created a design process that's similar to many that you've probably seen before. So because we work from people from industrial design, organizational development, the business world, architecture, across many, many dif disciplines, we try to create a unifying language to, to help them communicate. And so the four general phases that we, um, that we use are the scoping, which is a pretty common practice, I think. This is the creation of a design brief. Um, but we integrate life's principles into the front end of that scoping phase. And we also identify function. What functions are we trying to perform? Uh, and then the, because we identify function, it allows us to go to the biological literature in a, in a different way, in a more meaningful way. And then we have the discovering phase, which I think, from what I understand, this part's pretty much I mean, I think that something that would be um, synonymous in architecture would be looking to other projects that have already been built. But for us, we're looking towards other biological models that would be similar to our challenge. And then during the creating phase, this is the part that you guys know really well as design students, to actually get pen to paper. And then there's an evaluating phase that we um, often talk about using life's principles as our criteria for sustainability. So I'm going to go through some case studies now. Um, how many of you have seen a biomimicry presentation before? OK. OK, good percentage of the audience. OK. So you may have seen some of these case studies before. Um, 
and I, I chose lots from different disciplines just to give you a sense of what's happening across the board, but many from the built environment as well. Most of my work in biomimicry has been in the built environment. Okay, so the first question I want to ask is how can we improve aerodynamicism? So this is a train in Japan called the bullet train. Historically, it was called the bullet train. And um, they had this problem because it would go through tunnels in mountainous terrain of Japan. And it would, it would move at such a pace that it would build up a pressure gradient at the front of the train. And then when it got out of the tunnel, it would create a sonic boom. And so if you live nearby this train tunnel, obviously there's a problem with a sonic boom, you know, 12 times a day or whatever the train schedule is. And so there was an engineer tasked with figuring out how to solve this problem. And he was also a burger. And so he went to the equivalent of local Audubon Society meeting and, and started looking around at um, species that had the similar challenge of going from one pressure medium to another. And this bird that you see here is a kingfisher. So it's a diving bird, right? And it has to go from air pressure into water pressure. But uh, it can't make a splash because it's trying to hunt when it gets under the water. And obviously, it doesn't create a sonic boom when it goes through this pressure gradient change. And so this engineer applied this design principle, this shape, to the front of the train. And, um, and they, reduced the, they completely eliminated the sonic boom issue. And they also increased their fuel efficiency by 3%. OK, so as I mentioned, this wood material is effectively made of long chain carbons. Right? So a company called Novamer started putting together, or started developing um, catalysts to recombine carbon molecules uh, in such a way that they produce long chain carbons and produce plastics that are biodegradable, taking CO2 from the air and making it into a plastic. And they're doing right now, and actually the, the catalysts are made from limonene, which is a, a waste byproduct from the, um, the citrus industry. So if you get lemonade, you know, all that junk from the lemon has to go somewhere. And these guys found a new use for it. At this point, they're still, I think, probably just in like late stages of development and the early market phases. They're looking for some customized clients to really take this up to scale. But I think if anything could be a game changer, I think this one could. OK, so as I mentioned before, um, this is a coral, right? And so it's making material very similarly to how the sea is doing it, laying down a protein template, and then stacking up, attracting CO2 or calcium carbonate molecules to it um, to build this material out. And so this company called Calera um, found a way. It's started by this guy named Brett Constance, who's a material scientist who understands how nature makes these calcium carbonate materials. <clears throat> he started a company to make uh, green cement by pumping the flue gases from coal-fired power plants through salt water. And what precipitates out is a calcium carbonate, like a limestone, that can then be used as a base for cement. And so you have cement is one of the, as most of you know, I'm sure, one of the biggest producers of CO2 that we have within the built environment and across the, the, you know, the, the entire sector. Uh, and so this cement is actually a carbon sequester. So this organism here is a Namibian desert beetle. And they live in a very, very dry environment in the Namibian desert. And um, the only water that they get access to is a fog. Okay, So this fog rolls in. And when it does, they climb up to the top of that ridge, and they put their elytra in the air. So their elytra are the hard covering on their wings. Okay, And as you can see here, their elytra have a series of bumps and then channels. Okay, I'm a little, It's kind of hard to point with this thing. But the bumps are hydrophilic. They're, hydro they're water loving. And then the channels are hydrophobic. Okay, So that's water hating. So the dew accumulates on the bumps. So they've got yeah, their elytra in there like this. The dew accumulates on their bumps. And then it falls in, when they get heavy enough, it falls in the hydrophilic cha hydrophobic channels, and then it runs straight into their mouth. So they figure out how to drink from the air. Like, come on, how cool is that? So um, there's a company called Kinetic U, which is, they're actually a defense contractor out of the UK, so it's a little bit hard to get information from them. But um, there are several companies now that are doing this that have produced a fabric 
So what you see here is a piece of fabric that's stretched across on a metal frame, like, you would, like it's like a tarp almost, that has this material that's hydrophobic and hydrophilic, and so it collects water from fog and then drains it into a central location where it can be used as drinking water. Uh, so this ivy is moving up this wall as a way to utilize space that is currently underutilized in its view. There's too much competition for sunlight on the ground, so it's going to start moving up this wall. So um, some designers, a group of designers from a small emerging firm uh, out of Brooklyn called Smith, developed this product called Grow, these two products called Grow 1 and 2. Um, and they, they're at the prototype phase at this point, I think maybe a couple of installations of it. But what they've done with it is found a way to create a facade using this same principle of underutilized space. And so they have all these, what you kind of see there on that shiny surface is um, small solar panels. And they're actually use, they're trying to use a, a process for manufacturing called dye-sensitized solar cells, which doesn't use a lot of the heavy metals, which is one of the major problems with solar panels today. Um, and also, in the stems of these leaves are what are called um, piezoelectric crystals. So a piezoelectric crystal is a, is a substance that transfers kinetic energy into electric energy. So as the wind blows across the surface of these leaves, the energy that is collected by these piezoelectric crystals um, goes to power the building because it gets turned into electric energy. Talk about multi multifunctionality. Like they, they were really looking for opportunity here. Okay, so this is a termite mound in Africa. And termites are really fascinating little creatures. Um, they do a lot of really interesting things, but um, I won't go into all the details because that would be way too nerdy. But um, there are these holes that are right here, sort of around the base, okay? And then the top, there's like one central chamber. That, that goes up through the middle of this, and then there's a hole at the top. And some researchers started kind of looking at the, the structure here and trying to figure out what was going on with this, this structure. And because the termites live in a symbiotic relationship with a fungus, they have to maintain a really constant temperature inside of their mounds. And so what the researchers discovered when they started looking at this structure was that they actually had created a passive ventilation system. So those air holes by the, the ground are drawing in um, warm air just from below the surface, drawing it underground, and then it's being cooled underground and drawn out through that smokestack on the top, that hole on the top. So you have this passive ventilation system happening. So some engineers at Arup worked with um, a designer, an architect named uh, Mick Pierce to design a building in Harare in Zimbabwe that mimic these same principles. And so there aren't, actually isn't any uh, proper AC in this building. There's only these two big fans that are right here at the top of the building. And, and then other than that, it's just pulling the air, cool air from underneath where it's shaded. Um, and the, the cost savings, it, it uses like 10% of a building, similar building in this really hot climate for energy use. And then the cost savings are passed on to the tenants. It's a mixed use retail um, office building. The next example is by a firm called Foster and Partners. This is a glass sea sponge. And it's a, um, it's a deep sea organism that lives pretty much in darkness, but it's actually made of silicates. So it's made of glass, effectively. And, um, sorry, I got time. So what you see on this is it's really fascinating because it lives at such deep um, pressures, it has to have a whole lot of structural support behind it. And so you actually have like seven tiers of structural integrity. You can see how it's kind of winding around this way and it's going up and down and then you have sort of diagonals going this way and going this way. So the designers at Foster and Partners designed a building called the Swiss Reinsurance Building. Um, it's also um, known as the Gherkin and other things in the UK. Um, but it also has this, this core on the inside where circulation happens, and then it has the um, structural integrity happening around it all of these different directions. And because it has this internal core that is in the Fibonacci sequence, or this um, spiral pattern on the inside, 
the, the natural flow of the system, the HVAC system, is much more efficient, and I think they have about a, a energy reduction of about 40% compared to other buildings of a similar size. Just by adding that one simple element of you know, making the flow happen the way that nature wants it to happen. Okay, so now I want to talk a little bit about um, some of the work that, that we've done um, in our organization. So just to be clear, we talk a lot about, we represent biomimicry in the world, and then we get into representing some of, some of our work. So we've been working a lot with a, um, developing a, a tool that we call Genius of Place. So you can go into any different environment and do an assessment of the organisms who are living there to determine the best way to live there effectively. You're just looking at what design principles and design patterns there are that, uh, we, that could serve the design needs that we have. So the best way to do this is just to talk, talk through example. So I was leading a group of, um, of designers in, from HOK um, at Biosphere 2, which is, I'm not sure if, you, I guess you guys might not know about, you guys know about this project, Azaya Tucson? Okay. Um, it was really fascinating just because we're at the Biosphere 2 where we tried to hold the bull still and it failed, <laughs> really failed. Um, so that was a lot of lessons in and of itself. But we also got to talking about the local organisms who live there. And this is a uh, barrel cactus that lives in this environment. And it has a lot of different strategies for fitting in here. Um, one of the strategies that you see is that the, the spines that come out of it are actually in a shape such that it creates um, enhanced turbulence around the plant so that it's enhanced cooling. Another strategy that you see uh, is this pleated structure. Okay, so the pleated structure is so that no matter where the sun is in the sky, there's always one part of the plant that is shaded. So it creates shades behind itself. And then within the crevices, there's another special function. So plants on their surface have um, what are called stomata. So stomata open and close to allow for gas exchange to happen during photosynthesis. And so they're letting um, oxygen out and taking CO2 in. When they open, one of the things that happens is they lose a lot of moisture at the same time. So the name of the game in the desert is to retain moisture and exchange gases. So what these organisms have done is that they've placed their stomata, where they're more, most vulnerable, in these crevices. And then on the edge here, there are fewer stomata because they're more exposed. So we start talking about this design principle, this genius of this place. And um, the resulting design concept was this mock-up of a building design that had a similar, similar sort of um, layout of openings. So here you have the overall structure. You can see there's sort of a crack coming in here. Here's a, a cross section of it. So on the end, you don't have any openings to the outside environment, and then they're closer together here. Or sorry, there's less opening here, and then more exposure here in those cracks where it's shaded. Another example is of the black-tailed prairie dog. Uh, this is a project we worked on just outside of Denver on the front range of the Rocky Mountains. And um, Prairie dogs live in these communal, they're, they're really fascinating social creatures. Um, so they live in these communes, I guess we'll call them communes. And um, they live in chambers that have a, a passive ventilation system, not unlike the termite mound. So you have this, um, the, the mountains are over here. So you have this wind that comes off the mountains. And then there's a rounded edge that passes over. There, there's, the wind can pass over it here. Or because there's a rounded edge, the wind sort of gets drawn in. And then on the exit side, if you will, there, there's a mound that's higher. right? So you have that same sort of passive, passive ventilation thing happening. <laughs> the air is drawn in, and then it moves out here. And so we, we tried applying this design concept to a building in the environment. And this one ended up sort of just an early phase kind of sketches. Um, last I heard, anyway. A lot of times, the work that we do, I, I never know what happens with it. Like, I just found out a couple weeks ago that um, some work I did five years ago ended up with patents, and we just found out. So you just never know what's going to happen in the world. And when you put good intention out there, who knows? Anyhow, so another, another example of incorporating that genius of place. So this is a bromeliad. Um, 
And bromeliads live in uh, moist forests. If, if you're familiar with pineapple, right? Pineapple top is also a bromeliad. It's the same family. But some of them have entire ecosystems in them. So like this one, you can see there's a little bit of water in the middle. Some of them can hold like a gallon of water in them. And then they support all sorts of other species, frogs and lizards and bugs and all kinds of stuff. And they also, because they hold so much water, they regulate the overall hydrology of the entire system. The Mata Atlantica is a, a forest system in Brazil um, where I was, I was working on a project. And, um, and so <clears throat> we started talking about how the Bromeliad plays a major role in this environment. And the design team came back with a concept of a roof system that played a very similar function, performed a very similar function. So you can see here that the roof is intended to gather water and then it funnels it down through five stories or so into a storage tank down at the bottom and that can, water can be reused. And so now if we get back to the nature as um, measure component, here's another concept we've been working with called ecological performance standards. So if you think about all the different materials that are flowing through a biological system or a human system, you have water collection and storage happening, you have solar gain and reflectance, you have carbon sequestration, you have water filtration, evapotranspiration rates, um, nitrogen and phosphorus cycling. Right? All of these materials and energy, energetic movements are always happening in a nat native system. And so, and they can be quantified, especially now that we have the sophistication of technology to quantify um, a, lot of, a lot of how these things are happening. Um, we really have the, the numbers for how it's happening. And the discipline of ecology really is only 40 years old, 50 years old. And so we, we sat back for a second and thought, okay, what if our built environment had the same performance criteria? Rather than, being, you know, rather than reducing our energy consumption by 50%, which is a good goal, now don't get me wrong, it's a good place for us to go, but it's kind of arbitrary in the grand scheme of things in the sense that we're not basing that standard on the, the criteria of the biosphere within the operating conditions of the biosphere. And so if we try to recalibrate that to be the, the native system, be participating in the native system in the way that the native organisms are, we have much different metrics. We have a much different starting point for where we're trying to, we're trying to get to. So we've been working on this concept called ecological performance standards for four or five years now. And we've done a couple different pilot projects. Um, and we're also doing some grant funded work to do some more research around design thinking using this tool. But I'll walk you through one example in Lavasa, India. Um, it's working, we've worked on a new, a new development there for about 500,000 people. Um, amazing development in India right now. And um, it's, the development's called Lavasa. So just to kind of set the stage for where we're talking geographically, okay? So if you have India that kind of goes down like this, follow my human map here. On this side of the, the um, country, you have a mountain range called the Western Ghats, okay? So, and then Lavasa is sort of just right over the Western Ghats as they kind of start sloping down over to the Deccan Plateau which covers the rest, almost the rest of the country. And so you have these weather patterns that the monsoon starts escalating over here, the ocean, and then it picks up and starts dropping water in the Western Ghats. And um, the humidity levels that are in the atmosphere pull it across the mountain range. And then by the time it gets to the Deccan Plateau, it's pretty much worn out. Okay, so you have a rain shadow that happens just on the other side. That's where the Deccan Plateau starts. And so what happens at Lavasa is that this, um, it's a moist deciduous forest, forest there, so it's really um, humid temperatures, not unlike what you guys are familiar with here. And the, um, as the forest is, is thinning, um, it's slowly like le releasing less and less humidity into the air. Normally this environment gets nine meters of rain in three months. It's 27 feet almost of rain in three months. It's an enormous amount of rain. But as deforestation is happening, it's getting less and less, right? And the monsoon's not coming as far across the, the mountains. And so we started looking at exactly what was happening in this system and, and trying to quantify it, see if we could measure it. 
And what we found is that in the moist deciduous forest across many different landscapes, 10, 10 to 20% of the rainfall ends up as surface runoff. Okay, so this is just bouncing off the plants, going right back into recharge the aquifer, or groundwater. You have 7 to 10% of the rainfall that ends up as pipe flow. And pipe flow happens in this, in, in this ecosystem because they're very specialized soils that are well adapted to manage this nine meters of rain that they get. So they're sort of like these tubes that form in the soil that the water just sort of runs down um, into them and then back into the groundwater. 20 to 30% is returned directly to the atmosphere through evaporation. Okay, so it's lining on the, on the canopy of the forest and then it's evaporating back out and being released back into the environment, creating that moisture. And then 40 to 60% of the rainfall ends up in the soil and vegetation of the forest. So that's being held in, the, in its place there for a while before it's, and then it's being released slowly over time. So if you can imagine, we have five trees, right, that represent all of these. This, this is just water, right? We could do this categorically for, we have done them for several categories now. So you take out five trees and you put a building there. Then we know that our building should also, we can quantify how much water it should be releasing back into the environment. We can quantify that it should be only holding on to 40 to 60% of the water that falls there before it's released. It should be releasing X amount immediately so that the fish downstream have enough water to survive. Okay, so this is taking our our metrics to a whole different kind of level. And I mean, there's an immense amount of research that has to go into a process like this and then also an immense amount of opportunity because it, it, tells, it gives a totally different standard for, um, for what sustainability means. And as Janine likes to say, humans will be truly sustainable when our cities are functionally indistinguishable from our forests. So, hmm, now what do we do, hmm? Well, the first thing to do is to go outside. We're almost finished here, so you can go outside in this one. But go outside and pay attention. Just listen for a moment to the subtle signals that are all around us all the time. And we used to know how to pay attention to these subtleties. We used to be really attuned to understanding when the moisture in the air wasn't the same as it was five years ago, you know? And we, we just have, we haven't lost that sense, but we've kind of forgotten how to use it, I think. But I, I, it's still there. So we need to go outside and we need to quiet our cleverness. And we are still a really young species on this planet. Life has been here for 3.8 billion years. And we're just like a blip, a blip in that time frame. And just imagine for a minute what we can learn about creating lightweight structures making materials from carbon, keeping cool, avoiding the rain, slowing down moving water, making waterproof materials, creating boundary layers, repurposing spaces. There's a whole lot to learn out there if we just learn to ask the right questions. So a few things that you could do, as I said, go outside. I recommend everybody does this all the time. Um, and we ask a lot of our students to start nature journals and just have some sort of regular practice of going out and spending 20 minutes observing. Um, and if you're interested, I can, I can share with you some ex exercises afterwards about if you want to get into that. Buy a field guide. Just get to know the place around you, having that sense of place. You can take a workshop with us. We do a lot of um, backyard workshops. It's our three days. We do one-week courses. Um, we just actually, a couple years ago, launched a professional pathways program, which is a certification program um, to accredit people in a, either a specialization, which is a nine-month course, or um, a two-year course. And those are hybrid um, in-person sessions along with remote. Um, I'm teaching an online course right now. Um, the work that I do is predominantly, oops, that predominantly within the consultancy. I'm actually the director of consulting for Biomimicry 3.8. And um, I do a lot of direct work on projects, built environment projects, as well as product design. And then we have the Biomimicry 3.8 Institute, which uh, focuses on education, K-12 education, university education, 
Um, and then informal education, which includes museum exhibits and, and lots of other exciting things. So if you want information, you can go to biomimicry.net. And I'll warn you in advance that we are in the process of changing our website, <laughs> totally revamping it, so it's really messy. Apologies in advance if you do go there. <laughs> Oh. And then one last site I wanted to talk to you about is um, Ask Nature, which is a site that we developed to do, um, so it's a, basically a Google of nature's functions. So you can go to this site, type in how would nature filter water, and what comes back are lots of organisms that filter water and um, lots of different biomimetic technologies um, that are, are functioning this way. And most importantly, we have to get excited. We have to believe that the future is going to be a good one, or it won't be. <laughs> I really think that this is true. You know, I, um, in college, I was, um, I was an activist in college, and I just got so tired of saying no all the time. And so it was really just, and then I went to hide in the field and be a biologist. And so when I found biomimicry, I was like, I can say yes. OK, we found a way to say yes. Um, so, and I, I think it's important that we do that with enthusiasm. So on behalf of 100 million soft-spoken species, thank you for your attention today.